King's Cross. It was still in King's Cross. We finished that one, right? Did we? I don't know. He was, he was talking to Dumbledore in as, as a... Right. Okay, so maybe... I think you might have just stopped. You said your throat hurt. Oh, that's right, yeah. So, so you were not quite at the, the end yet. Yes. No, I have to find my... There we are. Thank you for reading to me. That's too bright. Well, I guess that's okay. At last, he said, Grindelwald tried to stop Voldemort going after the wand. He lied, you know, pretended he had never had it. The mother nodded. Going down at his left, tears still glittering on the crooked nose. They say he showed remorse in later years, alone in his cell at Normengard. I hope that it is true. I would like to think he did feel the horror and shame of what he had done. Perhaps that lie to Voldemort was an attempt to make amends, to prevent Voldemort from taking the hollow. Or maybe from breaking into your tomb, suggested Harry, at Dumbledore Dabby's eyes. After another short pause, Harry said, you tried to use the resurrection stone. Dumbledore nodded. When I discovered it after all those years, buried in the abandoned home of the Gons, the hello I craved most of all, through in my youth, though in my youth, I think, I had wanted it for a very different reasons. I lost my head, Harry. I quite forgot that it was now a horcrux, that the ring was sure to carry a curse. I picked it up and put it on. For a, for a second I imagined that I was about to see Ariana and my mother and my father, and to tell them how very, very sorry I was. I was such a fool, Harry. After all those years, I had learned nothing. I was unworthy to unite the Deathly Hallows. I had proved it time and time again, time and again, and here was final proof. Why, said Edgar, it was natural. You wanted to see them again. What's wrong with that? Maybe a man in a million could unite the hallows, Harry. I was fit only to possess the meanest of them, the least extraordinary. I was fit to own the elder one, and not to boast of it, and not to kill with it. I, permitted, I was permitted to tame and to use it, because I took it not for gain, but to save others from it. But a cloak I took out of vain curiosity, so it could never have worked for me as it works for you, his true owner. The stone I would have used in an attempt to drag back those who are at peace, rather than to enable my self-sacrifice, as you did. You are the worthy possessor of the hallows. The muller patted Harry's hand, and the Harry looked up at the old man and smiled. He could not help himself. How could he remain angry with the muller now? Why did you have to make it so difficult? The muller's smile was tremulous. I, was, I am afraid I counted on Miss Granger to slow you up, Harry. Uh... I was afraid that your hot head might dominate your good heart. I was scared that if presented outright with the facts about those tempting objects, you might seize the hallows as I did at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. If you, if you laid hands on them, I wanted you to possess them safely. You are the true master of death, because a true master does not seek to run away from death. He accepts that he must die, and understands that there are far, far worse things in the living world than dying. And Voldemort never knew about the hallows? hallows? I do not think so, because he did not recognize the resurrection stone he turned into a horcrux. But even if he had known about him, Harry, I doubt that he would have been interested in any except the first. He would not think that he needed the cloak, and as for the stone, whom, he, whom, whom, whom would he want to bring back, from, bring back from the dead? He fears the dead. He does not love. But you expected him to go after the wand. I have been sure that he would try, ever since your wand beat Voldemort's in the graveyards of Little Hangleton. At first he was afraid that you had conquered him by superior skill. Once he had kidnapped Ollivander, however, he discovered the existence of the twin cores. He thought that explained everything. Yet the borrowed one did do no better against yours. So Voldemort, instead of asking himself what quality was in you that had made your one so strong, what gift you possessed that he did not, naturally sent out to find the one, the one when that they said would beat any other. For him, the Elder One has become an obsession to rival his obsession with you. He believed that the Elder One removed his last weakness and made him truly invincible. Poor Severus. If you planned your death with Snape, you meant him to end up with the Elder One, didn't you? I admit it, it was my intention, said the Muller, but it did not work as intended, did it? No, said Harry, it did, but that, that bit didn't work out. 
The creature behind him jerked and moaned, and Harry and Dumbledore said without talking for the longest time yet. The realization of what would happen next settled gradually over Harry in the long minutes, like softly falling snow. I've got to go back, haven't I? That is up to you. I will have choice. Oh yes, Dumbledore smiled then. Near in King's Cross, you say? I think if you, if you decided not to go back, then you would be able to, let's say, board a train. And where would it take me? On, said Dumbledore simply. Silence again. Voldemort's got the Elder Wand. True, Voldemort has the Elder Wand. But you want me to go back? I think, said Dumbledore, if, if you choose to return, there is a chance that, you may, that he may be finished for good. I cannot promise it, but I know this, Harry, that you have less to fear from returning here than he does. Harry glanced again at the raw-looking thing that trembled and choked in the shadow beneath the distant chair. Do not pity the dead, Harry. Pity the living, and above all, those who live without love. By returning, you may assure that fewer souls are maimed, fewer families are torn apart. If that seems to me, if this seems to you a worthy goal, then we say goodbye for the present. Harry nodded and sighed. Leaving this place would not be nearly as hard as walking into the forest had been, but it was warm and light and peaceful here, and he knew that he was seen heading back to pain and fear and more loss, fear of more loss. He stood up and Dumbledore did the same, and they looked for a long moment into each other's faces. Tell me one last thing, said Harry. Is this real? Or has it been happening inside my head? Dumbledore beamed at him, and his voice sounded loud and strong in Harry's ears, even though the bright mist was descending again, obscuring his figure. Of course it is happening inside your head, Harry, but why on earth do you have been that it is not real? And that was the end of the chapter. Chapter 36, The Flaw in the Plan He was lying face down on the ground again. The smell of the forest filled his nostrils. He could feel the cold, hard ground beneath his cheek, and the hinge of his glasses, which had been knocked sideways by the fall, cutting into his temple. Every inch of him ached, and the pleasure and the, and the place where the killing curse had hit him felt like a bruise or an iron, or an iron of an iron clad punch. He did not stir, but remained exactly where he had fallen, with his left arm bent out at an awkward angle and his mouth gaping. He had expected to hear cheers of triumph and jubilation at his death, but instead hurried footsteps, whispers, and solicitous murmurs filled the yard. My lord, my lord! It was Bellatrix's voice as she spoke, as if, as if to a lover. Harry did not dare open his eyes but allowed his other senses to explore the predicament. His predicament. He knew that his wand was still stowed beneath his robe, because he could feel it pressed between his chest and the ground. A slight cushioning effect in the area of the stomach told him that the invisibility cloak was also there, stuffed out of sight. My lord! That will do, said Voldemort's voice. More footsteps. Several people were backing away from the same spot. Desperate to see what was happening, and why Harry opened his eyes by a millimeter. Voldemort seemed to be getting to his feet. Various Death Eaters were hurrying away from him, returned to the crowd, lying in the clearing. Bellatrix alone remained behind, kneeling beside Voldemort. Harry closed his eyes again and considered what he had seen. The Death Eaters had been huddled around Voldemort, who seemed to have fallen to the ground. Something had happened when he had hit him with a hilly killing curse. Had Voldemort too collapsed? It seemed like it. And both of them had fallen briefly unconscious, and both of them had now returned. My lord, let me... I do not require assistance, said Voldemort coldly. And though he could not see it, Harry pictured Bellatrix as drawing a helpful hand. The boy, is he dead? There was complete silence in the clearing. Nobody approached Harry, but he felt their concentrated gaze. It seemed to press him harder into the ground. He was terrified. A finger or an eyelid might twitch. You, said Voldemort, and there was a bang and a small shriek of pain. Examine him. Tell me whether he is dead. Harry did not know who had been sent to verify. He could only lie there with his heart thumping traitorously and want to be examined. And wait to be examined, but at the same time, noting small, uh, noting small compared to it was, that Voldemort was very, very, was wary of approaching him, that Voldemort suspected that all had not come to plan. And, softer than he had been expecting, touched Harry's face, pulled back an eyelid, crept crack beneath his shirt, down to his chest and felt his heart. He could hear the woman's fast breathing, her long hair tickled his face. He knew that she could feel the steady pounding of the life against his ribs. Is Rego alive? Is he in the castle? The whisper was barely audible. Her lips were an inch from her from his ear. Her head bent so low that her long hair shielded his face from onlookers. Yes, he breathed back. He felt the hand on his chest contract. Her nails pierced him. Then it was withdrawn. She had sat up. He is dead, Narcissa Malfoy called to the watchers. And now they shouted, now they yelled in triumph, and stamped their feet. 
and through his eyelids Harry and through his eyelids Harry saw bursts of red and silver light shoot into the air in celebration. Still feigning death on the ground, he understood. Narcissa knew that the only way she would be permitted to enter Hogwarts was uh, and find her son was as part of a conquering army. She no longer cared whether Voldemort won. You see, screeched Voldemort over the tum tumult. Harry Potter is dead by my hand, and no man alive can threaten me now. Watch, Crucio! Harry had been expecting it. He knew his booty would not be allowed to remain unsullied about the forest floor. It must be subjected to humili humiliation and prove Voldemort's victory. He was lifted into the air and took all his determination to retain to remain limp. Yet the pain he expected did not come. He was thrown once, twice, three times into the air. His glasses flew off and felt his wand slide a little beneath his robes. But he kept himself floppy and lifeless. Lifeless. And while he fell to the ground for fell to the ground for the last time, the clearing echoed with jeers and shrieks of laughter. Now, said Voldemort, you go to the castle and show them what will become of their hero. Who shall drag the body? No, wait. There was a fresh outbreak of laughter, and after a few moments Harry felt the ground trembling beneath him. You carry him, Voldemort said. He will be nice and visible in your arms, will he not? Pick up your little friend, Hagrid, and the glasses. Put on his glasses. He must be recognizable. Someone slammed Harry's glasses back on his face with a deliberate force, but the enormous hand that lifted him into the air were extremely, exceedingly gentle. Harry would feel Hagrid's arms trembling with the force of his heaving sobs. Great tears splashed down upon him as Hagrid cradled Harry in his arms, and Harry did not dare by movement or word to intimate to Hagrid that all was not yet lost. Move, said Voldemort, and Hagrid stumbled forward, forcing his way through the close growing trees. Back through the forest, branches caught Harry's hair and robes, but he lay quiescent, his mouth blowing open, his eyes shut, and into the darkness. While the Death Eaters crowded all around him, and while Hagrid sobbed blindly, nobody looked to see whether a pulse beat in the exposed neck of Harry Potter. The two, giant crashed, two, the two giants crashed along behind the Death Eaters. Harry could hear trees crackling and falling, creaking and, and, creaking and falling. That was Gorp or Grope? No, there was two Death Eaters. There two giants. No, I don't think so. Okay. No Grop. Grop. At least it doesn't say so. Mm. They made so much din that birds arose, shrieking into the sky, and even into the, and even the jeers of Death Eaters were drowned. The victorious procession marched on towards open ground, and after a while Harry could tell, by the lightning of the darkness through his closed eyes, that the trees were beginning to thin. Bane! Hagrid's unexpected bellow near, near forced Harry's eyes open. Happy now are you? You didn't fight? You covered Lebuns and Nags? Are you happy Harry Potter is the dead? Hagrid could not continue, but broke down in fresh tears. Harry wondered how many centaurs were watching their procession pass. He dared not open his eyes to look. Some of the Death Eaters called insults at the centaurs as they left them behind. A little later, Harry sensed by a freshening of the air that they had reached the edge of the forest. Stop! Harry thought that Hagrid must have been forced to obey Voldemort's command, because he lurched a little. And now a chill settled over them where they stood, and Harry heard the rasping breath of Dementors that patrolled the outer trees. They wouldn't affect him now. The fact of his own survival burned inside him, and fell his man against him, as there was Father Stag of Guardian in his heart. Someone passed close by Harry, and he knew it was Voldemort himself, because he spoke a moment later, his voice magically, ma magically magnified so that it swelled through the grounds, crashing upon Harry's eardrums. Harry Potter is dead. He was killed as he ran away, trying to save himself, while you lay down your lives for him. We bring you his body, as proof that your hero is gone. The battle is won. You, left, you have lost half your fighters. My Death Eaters outnumber you, and the boy who lived is finished. There must be no more war. Anyone who consists, continues to resist, man, woman or child, will be slaughtered, as will be every member of their family. Come, up, come out of the castle now, kneel before me, and you shall be spared. Your parents and children, your brothers, your sisters will live, and be forgiven. If you will join me in the new world, we shall build together. There was silence in the ground, and from the castle, Voldemort was so close to him that Harry did not dare open his eyes again. Come, said Voldemort, and Harry heard him move ahead, and Hagrid was forced to follow. Now Harry opened his eyes a fraction, and saw Voldemort striding in front of him, wearing the great snake Nagini around his shoulders who was now free of her enchanted cage. But Harry had no possibility of attracting the wand concealed under his robe without being noticed by the Death Eaters, who marched on either side of them through the slowly lightening darkness. Harry, so Hagrid, oh Harry, Harry! Harry shut his eyes tight again. He knew that they were approaching the castle and strained his ears to distinguish above the gleeful voices of the Death Eaters 
in their tramping footsteps, signs of life from those within.